So hello everyone. I'm very pleased to, to open the first edition of uh, this uh, policy forum, uh, jointly organized by uh, the Center of Economic Policy Research and uh, Paris School of Economics. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to welcome this uh, collaboration with uh, CEPR, with whom we share the same, uh, the same objective to, to feed the public debate through uh, rigorous and, uh, pub police and data driven research. So, this forum is uh, perfectly in line with uh, this objective. And it's exactly what we had in mind with uh, Daniel Cohen, president of Paris School of Economics, when we decided to launch this event a couple of months ago. So for five days, leading researchers will deal, uh, will deal with uh, some uh, of the most important issues I think we all face, regardless uh, of the of the place we have in, in, in society. Just maybe to mention a few of them, it will be uh, at the end of uh, each day. First one, maybe especially for, for this day, how to think about the development of the poorest countries at a time when uh, the development model he has to be renewed to deal with the, the ecological transition. What policies are best suited to, uh, to ensure the social cohesion in our more and more uh, fragmented and segmented societies? Are we back uh, in an inflationary world with uh, this unpleasant uh, dilemma between uh, inflation and unemployment that we had forgotten for the last uh, three uh, decades. And uh, finally, what economic policy will uh, really enable us uh, to make the energy transition to meet uh, our uh, challenge in terms of climate change? On all these uh, questions, economists uh, will have to, uh, to propose uh, new policies and at the same time uh, rigorous assessment of their economic and social impact. This uh, will certainly involve to shifting the frontier of knowledge in economics, but also certainly to work working more with other disciplines, other sciences and uh, interacting uh, more, closing, more closely with uh, policy makers. <coughs> so this is why we, we create this uh, policy forum and with the hope uh, to contribute uh, to creating uh, a space devoted to the discussion of uh, the most important challenges we, we face <coughs> among leading researchers and policy makers and reaching a large audience. This is also we make a great place to, uh, to PhD students and a presentation of their work because we think that uh, they will uh, certainly participate in uh, providing new ideas in, in the future. So, I would like to uh, sincerely thank all the researchers and policy makers to have accepted our invitation. And uh, also many thanks to uh, the PC uh, team for the organization of uh, this event in all uh, the dimension of uh, the organization from uh, logistics under the direction of Anya Fur to uh, communication under the supervision of uh, Luis Gadras and under the overall supervision of, uh, of Francesco Papada. So I'm delighted that you, to see that you are so many 
few uh, here in this room. And I, I wish you an excellent day. And for the most motivated few, uh, an excellent week. Uh, so, I just to say to, to conclude that I will leave in a few seconds the floor to my colleague Oliver Van den Heide to introduce uh, this special day devoted to uh, development issues. But before doing that, we are going to listen uh, an opening uh, message addressed sent by uh, Beatrice Veder Di Moro, uh, C uh, CPR president. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the first PSECPR policy forum here in Paris. I am not there yet, but I will join you later this week. I'm very much looking forward to this because it is a very special occasion and a very special week. First of all, it is special, of course, because we have a stellar lineup of keynote speakers. Some of the most influential minds in our pro profession will be starting every day. Second, it is special because we end every day with a policy conversation and this shows how serious it is taken to both combine excellence in research with relevance in policy. By the way, this happens to be the motto of the CEPR research excellence with policy relevance. Third, it is special because we have created a space to showcase young uh, scholars work. Every day there will be poster sessions and presentations from young scholars. And again, this is something that is very important and to the core of CEPR, the promotion of the younger the next, next generation of researchers and their engagement with the wider community. And speaking about wider community and audience, this forum is really addressing a wide audience of people interested in economics, media, decision makers, policy makers in governments um, and beyond. We are looking forward to making this a one of the main highlights on the agenda, on the economics agenda, um, all in the years coming uh, uh, also going forward. For CPR, this is a specially important milestone in the transition that we are on the full speed going. Uh, we are transitioning our headquarters from uh, London to Paris. And we already had to expand our office space in Paris, but the size of CEPR is not measured in square meters of offices. The size and impact of CEPR is much more, much better measured by the size and the power of its network. In fact, CEPR is not a think tank. We are a network of more than 1,700 academic economists who collaborate and use this platform to disseminate, create, and meet. If you want to um, see how much is going on at CEPR, I encourage you to look at our website uh, and as well as our policy platform, Box EU. I think you will agree that our CEPR is a network that works. And more and more, it is working in Paris which we are very happy about and grateful for. The gratitude I want to extend very much to the organizers of this forum, as well as speakers and everybody who made it possible. I now wish you a fantastic start of the week and thank you very much. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, kickstart uh, the very first day of this uh, uh, Policy Forum Week. Uh, with uh, with uh, development economics and on these type of events it's a, it's an obvious cliche that uh, speakers don't need an introduction but it's it's very hard to to think of uh, someone for whom this is more true than than, than Esther. Um, we're, we're very happy to have her here today. Um, it's uh, when when you think about uh, the, the the impact that that Esther has has had on our field. It's clear that, that, that she has really kind of uh, uh, driven the, the causality revolution in development economics, which, which has helped uh, our field to, to, to come up with uh, concrete policy interventions in a variety of areas, which uh, can, can kind of uh, legitimately claim 
in, in, in specific ways to have, to have the, the world, to have made the world a, a slightly better place. Um, at the same time, as, as Jean Louvier already hinted at, uh, there, there are uh, challenges coming ahead, particularly linked to uh, uh, climate change. And it's, it's uh, 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 an important moment, therefore, to, to keep on thinking about how our field can evolve to, to, to try to meet these challenges. From PSC's perspective, let me just say that uh, we feel extremely ho honored and, and, and grateful that we've been able to, to host Esther and, and, and Abhijit on, on multiple occasions. Uh, in, in the past and, and, and hopefully also in the, in, in the future. And I think generally it's, it's kind of uh, fortunate for, uh, for, for Europe, France, and also thanks through the role of the CPR that, that uh, SCS maintained this, this strong link with, uh, with the, the old continent. I, I think this is someone which has helped uh, develop the economics to kind of uh, weigh on policy making and to kind of uh, create a space for, for uh, policy-oriented, uh, evidence-based, and, and data-driven research. So without further ado, I, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll give the floor to, to Esther. So this first session, will I know we're running a tiny bit late, but the idea is that the first session runs until uh, 11, and we then have a, a short uh, coffee break. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, as Olivier said, I have a very strong link with PSC, so that's somewhat self-interested, a conflict of interest. But I really think this concept that uh, 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 Jean-Olivier, uh, the CEPR team, Daniel Cohen, uh, who unfortunately is not here today, um, came up with is really uh, wonderful. Uh, there are any number of, uh, of these uh, meetings, especially in the summer, uh, which are you know, economists talking to policymakers, but there is not one that has the seriousness of purpose that this one is meant to have. And uh, I really, really hope the concept catches up and, and uh, next year we don't even fit here and we have to uh, uh, do something creative about the space because that's, I, I think this is what we should be doing. <laughs> we should have real serious conversation and not just uh, uh, panels where we each took for tw three minutes and hope something comes out of it. The title though was given to me uh, and it's it's not a bad title but it's a little uh, uh, ambitious. So uh, I'm going to, so first of all I'm going to take this very broad title and bring it back to the very narrow uh, context of my own work uh, and in particular you'll, have pull, you'll uh, I hope you'll uh, excuse me for uh, a moment of vanity uh, slash self-reflection uh, I'm a little obsessed by the fact that JPAL Europe, JPAL, JPAL Global and JPAL Europe has its office here at PSC just turned 20, 2023 is our 20th year. And uh, last week we were all into celebrating JPAL at 20. So it's a little bit in my mind still. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put that very broad question in a, two thirds of my talk will take this very broad question in a narrow context of JPAL and in particular <coughs> the movement of randomized control trials. Uh, so JPAL turns 20 this year. We have uh, uh, JPAL like CEPR is a network, a little smaller, but uh, we have a little over 1,000 researchers who are involved in JPAL's work and of course uh, many more thousands of, uh, of partners in uh, NGOs, government, staff, and so on. And uh, uh, together this, this has led to a pretty big uh, uh, number of, of projects uh, over the years. This is not what we are doing today. This is what has been done uh, in the cumulative 20 years of JPAL, uh, 1600 evaluation across the whole world uh, almost and um, across various sectors ranging from education, agriculture, governance and, and so on. And JPAL also has had a uh, policy influence uh, this is uh, not the number of people that have been involved in any of our experiments. This is the number of people who have been uh, uh, touched by a policy that one of our affiliates in one of those projects found to be affected. So in a sense, it's a very misleading number because a lot of people also were not touched by policy that are ineffective, uh, but it's much harder to count. So we haven't been counting that, but that gives you a sense of uh, the, this idea that also is very much the idea of this particular colloquium is connecting the research to the, to the policy. 
So what I want to talk about today is I'm going to take this concept of development in the 21st century. 21st century. I'm going to start by talking about development economics in the 21st century, then uh, development policy in the 21st century, and then development finance in the 21st century, which that part of it will have nothing to do with GPL. That would be my uh, uh, running away from my very narrow parish. So the 21st century, of course, is uh, already 20 years old. Uh, so uh, all of this development of GPL happened in the 21st century. So in a sense, this is kind of what has already happened is this huge explosion uh, of, first of all, off the field, uh, which used to be pretty small uh, and has become so much larger and so much better represented in uh, both in academic journals, but also in policy conversation. Uh, and then what I want to do today very briefly is to say what lessons have we learned, uh, not uh, methodological, but more conceptual, uh, it's a little insight that have come up uh, from all of this work that I briefly flashed on the, on the field that might uh, tell us how, you know, what to take into account to conduct our work as development economists in the remaining 80 years and maybe beyond development economics uh, within economics generally. Uh, the first lesson that uh, I, I, perhaps is the most uh, uh, striking, and I think is the one that really led me personally to this field, is uh, suspect the obvious. So uh, many of you might have heard by now the, the story of uh, the first uh, randomized control trials almost the first in development, either the first or almost the first, started by Michael Kramer, uh, which were uh, about putting textbooks in, in schools. And the reason why uh, Michael picked this particular example is because he wanted to start working on this with, and he had a partner NGO and he wanted to show them that you can do it and you can demonstrate success. So he really picked a program that he felt was gonna work. So in a sense, this was more of a proof of concept for the methods, and he was looking for something that is pretty, you know, obviously a good thing. And this pretty obvious good thing was textbooks. So they started running this, this uh, RCT, first of all, in 14 schools, seven treatment, seven control, and then in 100 schools, uh, 25, 20, by groups of four that were kind of progressively brought in, into the program. And to cut a long story short, what they find is first order the textbook do not lead uh, to an increase in, uh, in test scores for the average child, although some children end up benefiting. Um, what was really fascinating to see as a student, because I was, a stu I was kind of seeing this movie as it was uh, being uh, 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 filmed and then uh, edited, <laughs> put together, is how uh, the initial reaction to the results were like, oh, it can't be true. We must have made a mistake in the experiment. So we have to kind of do it better. And then so far they started by, by uh, having better tests because the first test instruments were perhaps not very good. And then the better tests gave the same results. And maybe then the sample was too small. So then we have to do it again with a larger sample. And then, you know, the results were pretty stubborn. So that was very helpful in terms of all of these things that might have gone wrong, had gone wrong. So we were, uh, Michael uh, was kind of learning a lot about how, what to take into account when conducting this type of project and teaching it down to the rest of us PhD students. So that was the first very useful uh, role of this experiment. The second is that it, it ended up to really hold up that this obvious thing wasn't true. And over the year, uh, over the first years of experiments, a number of obvious results turned out to not to be true in this kind of idea that, you know, how do you make kids learn when they are in school? So that's a graph from India, but that's true kind of all over the world, that uh, all over the developing world, that kids, many, many kids now go to school, but they don't learn very much when they're in school. So about half of the kids who are reached uh, grade five uh, are able to read at grade two level. And uh, for that, for the idea of the quality of education, you know, there are a number of obvious solutions. Providing textbook was like the obvious, obvious. There are people who blame the teachers. Uh, so maybe you need to change the teachers or change the way they are paid or incentivized. 
Now, people who blame the children, often these are the teachers themselves, but not necessarily. Uh, maybe you don't directly blame the teachers, but you, uh, children, but you say, well, you know, they, they got poor nutrition, so they can't learn, which is kind of, I think, a more politically correct way of blaming the children. Uh, there are uh, people who say we need to change the teacher and fire them. There are people who say we need to pay them more. We need to add textbooks, computers, flip charts, uh, build toilets in school. And all of these things are in some at some point or another presented as an obvious solution, or at least an obvious part of the solution. And what is pretty striking is that uh, none of these really make a very big difference. Um, with perhaps the, uh, you know, at least originally, you know, giving incentive to teachers were also pretty disappointing. More recently, I think we get to better, more uh, uh, less pessimistic result in this. But the bottom line is that, you know, in, we were very lucky that Michael is a dogged person because other people would have given up. He was doing project after project and nothing works. Uh, but uh, yet it continued, and we learned this, and in some sense, that's why I got into this. Because I think if this first textbooks experiment had been successful, I would have been, okay, fine. You have some intuition, you run the experiment, you confirm your intuition, it's kind of a little boring. But in fact, the fact that the results keep not being what we expected is what I, I, I found to be really uh, exciting. And this has remained true. We really need to uh, uh, suspect the obvious. Um, I'm going to skip what's this one because uh, this this is not the main uh, this is not the main point to be made here. The second and of course that's related. Um, so the obvious in this sense is the intuition that people that we bring, but sometimes this intuition are kind of uh, nicely packaged in a, uh, in a theory, uh, and that this is more for us economists. Uh, um, what's you know. Um, the second point is be mindful of your theories. One of the theories that's perhaps the cornerstone of a lot of what uh, we do uh, as economists, and I, I think as very, very strongly percolated among policymakers as well, is the, the simple trade-off between labor and leisure, the fact that uh, they are therefore strong income effects. When people are become richer, they will work less. Uh, this is really like uh, so ingrained uh, in what we learn in school. Uh, this is economics 101, and therefore every policymaker has learned this idea as well, and you see it sometimes uh, come up uh, uh, in, in their speech. So that's a theory, but, uh, but it is a theory. And the question is, is, is it, uh, even though it's a theory that we hardly ever see, it's kind of the, the sun that... Uh, shines over everything, um, is it true? And I think one of the most striking uh, uh, lessons of the past uh, several years is that it happens to not fit the facts. Uh, and in particular, uh, giving people money doesn't make them lazy. Uh, so this is a, a, a graph from work by uh, Ben Olken, and, uh, Michael, uh, Ben Olken, Abhijit Banerjee, Rima Hanna. Uh, who put together a lot of uh, data from uh, various randomized control trials of uh, conditional cash transfers. So the conditional cash transfers are, are money that families get in exchange of doing stuff, but among this stuff, working is not one of them. So they get money to send their kids to school or, or to, uh, to get basic vaccination for them and so on and so forth. But then once they do that, they have, there is no requirement that they should work. This is not insignificant amount of money for this poor family. It's a lot of money. Uh, so really what we should see is that people should stop uh, or should work less when they get these transfers. And what you see across the board in all of this experiment is that there is really no difference either in the probability that someone works when they are in the control group versus the treatment group for these experiments or that uh, the number of hours that, that they work in a week. Uh, so this is one, one study that puts together a lot of study, one metallist puts together a lot of study, but it can, and then there are many more with various different kind of program, conditional, unconditional transfer assets uh, uh, programs like th uh, those that Dean has worked on. So eventually we have to kind of take that things head on. By the way, it's not just something we find in developing country. 
And uh, there was a very interesting example of the difficulty that there is uh, um, in the kind of uh, policymaker slash media world in accepting this kind of idea. Uh, during COVID, um, most of the rich countries had very uh, generous uh, uh, support policy for the affected population. Uh, in the US, it came in the form of uh, unemployment insurance that was ex very, very generous uh, with replacement rates often way above the salary that people were making before COVID. So from the very beginning, there was this worry that people would stop working. Here, it's not just the income effect people were worried about, but the substitution effect as well, because you don't get your unemployment insurance unless you're working. So the idea that people would work when they would get two times or three times more money by not working was uh, uh, relatively uh, controversial. So from the very beginning, a lot of people were worried about that. There were about six studies of the impact of, the COVID, of this COVID and employment insurance on people's reaction in the US. None of them randomized, but all of them pretty well done. And none of them found any impact. Um, so it is what it is. We c then we can explain it in many ways that it is, was transitory, so on, whatever. But the fact is, People did not stop working because uh, in order to take advantage of the COVID uh, unemployment insurance. There was a Wall Street Journal headline that says, uh, when uh, unemployment uh, pays more than work, people will stop working. And then that was kind of the, the headline. And then there was a subtitle, except at Yale, apparently. So the, the, so the idea is that, well, you really need to, like this crazy uh, academic to, to come up with this completely uh, alt fact type of uh, thing to... So the, their, their view of the world is so strong that uh, they could not be persuaded by the evidence that was just right in front of them. Um, so this is difficult, this is something that, and this is also difficult within the profession. I, I think now within the profession, it is this particular idea is making its way, but it's taken a long time because if you think about it, the first experiment that, sh that showed no to very weak income and substitution effect is the negative income ta tax experiment, which is the first big RCT like ever conducted uh, by in economics. And that result was already there. So it's been a while. It's been since the uh, mid 70s, early 90s, early 80s. Uh, and we are still kind of debating that, but less so. So it's coming along. Our profession is changing. Then these changes needs to need to kind of percolate. Uh, the third uh, point is that we've learned is kind of it's related. Maybe again, I think all of these points are somewhat related. But it's the idea of don't underestimate uh, human complexity. So why, why, for example, in this, you know, when people started to try to understand why people are not. Uh, uh, taking the unemployment insurance during COVID, a lot of the explanations were about, well, this is not lasting because COVID will go at some point. So you, you, you take a risk by giving up your job and then you might not find another one later and so on. This was, uh, by the way, without anticipating that everybody was quit anyway at the end, uh, sometime during COVID and did something different. But if you have an option to, to keep your work, you should. Or, so people were thinking in, in these terms. But there is another possibility related to this uh, don't overestimate uh, human complexity, that there are m m many more things in life other than labor and leisure, and in particular, many more uh, um, things that people derive from labor other than uh, a wage. And in particular, the fact that maybe people actually like to work, maybe not in the day-to-day -day of waking up and taking the subway, but in the kind of broader scheme of things of having a place uh, and a sense uh, of, of their work. I, um, and here there is one, you know, th there are many now studies that kind of uh, go uh, um, in this direction. I was just reading a, a study by Thomas Coutreau uh, on, uh, uh, about, about France. And, but this is one from, from Bangladesh. Uh, which is about a uh, refugee from Myanmar uh, who uh, end up in a uh, in refugee camp in, in Bangladesh. And mostly they, they, they can't do anything there. But they're not there for like five minutes. They've been there for, for, for months and then years. 
I was very little prospects of going home or leaving, and most of them cannot work. They have, there's nothing to do. So uh, a team of researchers, including uh, uh, Reshma Osam, and I'm sorry for not citing everybody, uh, did uh, a study where they offered people uh, either cash or uh, a job for earning this cash. Uh, so the job is to do survey of other people in the, in the, in the area. And um, the first finding is that people were actually willing to leave money on the table to get the job instead of the cash. So people are willing to be paid less to work than to not work, which is pretty striking in the context of this, uh, the theory I was talking about. And the second is what you see here. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what these things are, a bunch of stuff. Uh, but it's about, uh, basically, it's about people's uh, mental health, uh, 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 psychosocial well-being, the PHQ-9, uh, a psychosocial, uh, an index of psychosocial uh, uh, integration, their health. Uh, all of this is like to the right uh, uh, with this, the, the bands re representing confident intervals showing we can actually believe it's to the right. This is not comparing the program versus no money. It's comparing working versus the same amount of money or a little more in cash. And you can see how working has this uh, uh, value in and of itself. Of course, this is a pretty special setting where people might be bored out of their mind. And it's not that they can go to the museum if they don't, if they don't work. But I think the lesson might be a little more general than that, that there is uh, uh, um, other things that we care about. Uh, other than uh, leisure and money. And, and these other things uh, sometimes really change the conclusion that you could get uh, from uh, 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 about what type of intervention uh, policies, etc., might work on, on, on people. Uh, the, the fourth one, I think, uh, the fourth one of the lessons that I'm kind of carrying with me for the rest of the, for the 80 years that left uh, that are left uh, to us in this century also is to have have faith in, in the poor so just to be caricaturing a little bit you could you could have in mind a world where uh, a lot of people are poor because uh, they there's something wrong with them and so if you're right wing you could say they are lazy uh, or, or, or if you are right wing but from Chicago, you could say they rationally choose that they prefer to have less poverty and uh, less money and more leisure, or they have a high disutility of m money. Um, or uh, if you are, uh, uh, so that's that's kind of one way of of, of seeing it. And then there is another view that you know stuff happens. Uh, accidents happen, and then this, uh, you know, pandemic happen. Uh, so some shocks are individual. Um, uh, some shock are uh, collective. And that uh, in some settings, when the social protection system is not very strong, uh, when uh, it's very difficult to get back out of this shock, uh, get back on your feet after uh, you've, ex you've been exposed to one of these shocks. Um, so the, in that world, then, if, the, if it is really true, then it would be possible to take someone who is in poverty and uh, uh, give them a positive shock instead, get them out of this like situation where it's uh, there is a poverty trap and poverty feeds on itself, and they should be able to uh, climb up and up and up from that point onwards. So there are these two views, and uh, uh, they they are different in terms of the the policy implication, in terms of how you you're going to support people. Perhaps in one, you know, irrespective of your desire for a distribution, perhaps you're left wing, so you have a lot of uh, desire for a distribution, but you would structure it differently if you think it's. Uh, uh, characteristic of the individual, so you'll have to help them forever, perhaps in a somewhat patronizing way, or uh, it's a characteristic of the life they've had, in which case you might be able to give uh, tools in their hands. Um, this is the wonderful Bangladeshi organization BRAC, uh, who was uh, uh, launched by uh, Sir Abed, who, who died uh, very recently. Uh, 
uh, went with the uh, idea of that poverty is due to accumulating circumstances and developed a program uh, uh, which goes by various names, but one of them is a graduation program to reflect this idea that you can graduate out of poverty. And so their idea is like a really big push uh, intervention where uh, you give uh, a, a lot of resources to someone, not just money, but also support. Uh, and uh, the idea is that you would do that once and then people would be able to, to move on. I'm not going to show you all of the results from all over the world, but Dean Carlin, who is going to talk this afternoon, I don't know that he's talking about that, but he's talking about, so he'll do more. Uh, he'll tell you a bit much more about how the program works and what it does. I just want to show you one graph, which is uh, for in India, we've been following people uh, who participated in, in one of these experiments of this big, big push program over a period of time. And at least in this context, what you see is a growing gap uh, between people who got the program and people who didn't. In a context where actually the people were becoming less poor over time for any number of reasons. But that suggests that that, that that thing that people can get out of extreme poverty is, uh, is true. And therefore, uh, we should keep that in consideration and think how we are going to do that. Um, the last one in terms of lessons is this uh, um, idea that you have to uh, listen to, to people. Um, a lot of the... Um, I, Someone uh, from Togo uh, just sent me a, a cartoon uh, about the uh, new pub new finance for new the summit the Macron summit that took place last week, and it was about uh, uh, it's uh, President Macron and the president and uh, um, a representative of Kenya, so a minister from Kenya whose name I uh, now forget, and he says uh, I uh, the the representative of Kenya said, we don't want, we don't want your programs. Uh, and Macron is like all upset. Uh, so there is this idea that, you know, traditionally the, the, a lot of the development assistance has been predicated on the fact that we can tell a government what they should care about and we should uh, uh, maybe replace them in doing that to the extent we have money. And of course, what we realize now is this program is this, this kind of particular agenda is in big trouble because just we don't have, I think if we had enough money to do it, we would continue. I don't think the minds of people are really changed, but we just don't have enough money to do that anymore. Uh, or we never really had enough money, but now it's really getting so ridiculous. At the, at the individual level, uh, the same kind of thing tend to happen of we tend to think that we uh, we know what people need or what they want. Uh, and we is a very general we. It's not just uh, me who suddenly thinks that uh, a lot of the time. But also people from the capital of the countries have this opinion about people in the rural areas. And even in the rural areas, the district magistrate has this opinion about the people uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the field. And even the field officer of NGOs have this idea about the people uh, of, of and it leads to the conclusion of developing great solutions that people are not always interested about. Uh, and again, that's not just a problem in developing countries. I'll give you an example after this one that's very much a French or US problem. Uh, but I'll give you one example that I was involved with is the, the, the idea of smokeless stoves. So indoor air pollution is a huge problem in, in, uh, in many places in developing countries where people are Sm uh, cook on this uh, kind of little, they make a little fire inside their home and they cook on that and the level of particulate matters that they're exposed to when they cook and even outside is huge and uh, uh, contribute to uh, all sorts of uh, uh, res respiratory diseases. So it's kind of, a, seems like it should be avoidable. There have been a, a, a very big effort for years and years to develop this kind of uh, smokeless stove uh, concept. So the smokeless stoves are, are the same uh, uh, kind of fuel, but it's just enclosed and there is a chimney. Simple concept. Uh, so it should be obvious that this is something people, people want or would need. Uh, uh, there has been uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, put a ton of uh, money and her uh, capital behind this. And we worked with an NGO, uh, Graham Vekash in Orissa, who decided that everybody 
in the village they work with would have one of those. And we started with a with an RCT when when we you know we did a first group first. And what we found is that so people you know took it. Uh, it was free for them. They we installed it. They kept it. But within months, often weeks, they were starting to break. Now these things are pretty fragile, so it's not surprising. But there was a system to uh, to to get it fixed, uh, and uh, people weren't really calling that system. They didn't really love the stoves at all. Uh, there were a lot of problems with the way they were working that was made them pretty incompatible with the way they were cooking. Uh, so 60% within a few months were broken and not repaired. And therefore, the impact of CO2 in breath, which is your uh, kind of a proxy for, uh, for the air pollution, we had a little impact early on, which vanished very quickly. And then this program kind of got abandoned. So it's an example of, it's, if it was just like my one bad project, I would not show it, but it's just an example of making up a theory of what, uh, what are important to people, which I don't think we can not do, but it's just that we need to kind of acknowledge that these are theories and therefore uh, uh, test driving them before we move, we move forward and listen to people. Uh, so this is for this is for the insight that I will keep for keep for uh, for uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, kind of nourishing my work uh, moving forward in the next uh, eighty years or so. Now for development policy. So when I started this work, uh, I had this mind that I, I I came to I was doing history which I did like, and I only moved to economics because I thought I could make a difference in the world. So I didn't necessarily know exactly how when I started economics, but when I met uh, Michael and Abhijit, and I, you know, got a sense of what could be done. And then when this guy got into running randomized experiments, I I, I formed a model of how this things uh, this thing would work. So basically, you run your experiment, you get your results, you prepare a shiny uh, policy br brief, and you pedal it to policymakers. Uh, and then uh, you get full scale adoption. So that was, you know, honestly, kind of the, uh, is, uh, not necessarily very well conceived in my mind, but probably pretty close to the model I had. Uh, this model has been uh, subject to all sorts of critics over the years. Uh, well, those small experiments are gold plated, the samples are too, sm too small, the results are only valid in one place and not in another place, they don't replicate. Uh, um, there are issues with internal validity sometimes. Um, when you prepare your policy brief and you pedal it, if it doesn't fit with the policymaker interest, you know, even if those problems were not there, nobody's going to listen to you anyways. And then if you get full scale adoption, the results are going to be totally different because there are all these things you didn't take into account when working on small scale that are going to come when you're working on large scale. Uh, so all of these criticisms have some, uh, have some, have, uh, are valid, except for the one thing that it's just not at all the way that policy influence works. That's my mistake, maybe or our mistakes to kind of imagine it was going to be like that, but it's just not like that. It's not how it works. Uh, first of all, you'd never get uh, any policy influence from one experiment. It's always a combination of of, of things. Uh, both uh, uh, different, the same program in different areas. Uh, or similar-ish program in same or different areas. And it's only uh, uh, when all of these things get combined that you get influence, and, and really in the form of you should do A or you should do X, but more this is the class of solutions that have been shown promise in a context similar to yours. Um, so I've, 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 I've made this uh, analogy with a pointillist painting where you know, each point is really not particularly interesting or beautiful on its own. And then it's only when you move back and you're seeing you know, there is an area of green that's kind of maybe a series of experiments on education. And then uh, you move further and further back and eventually we'll have the whole uh, Ile de la Grande Jatte on the, on the canvas. So that's more how you want to think about how this work uh, becomes, uh, has policy influence. And another place it does is uh, in the uh, is more in the the day to day running of of policy, 
where uh, policymakers have a very clear view of what they want to do, uh, but they, there is a lot of possibility of how to do it. And uh, there is uh, an, a possibility to include uh, uh, research and even experimentation sometime in the course of these day-to-day -day interventions. Um, we had a, an example of that in the colloquium we did uh, last week with the Indonesian, the representative of the Indonesian organization that kind of is the go-between between, between uh, uh, the kind of US researchers and the government. He himself is, a, uh, I mean, this organization is full of excellent uh, researchers. And one example uh, that, that was there is the Raskin program. It's a program of rice distribution. If you ask the researchers, they would have dropped the Raskin program altogether. And finally, in fact, this is where it led. But initially, the, that was not at all the point of the government. The government wanted to just to run it better. And they realized that there was uh, an issue with this program, which is that uh, there is a lot of <laughs> leakage, let's say, on the ground, partly because people do not know what they are eligible for. So people, many people who are eligible for some subsidized rice, the program of subsidized rice distribution in Indonesia, a lot of people who are eligible don't know it and nobody tells them. So that creates you know, rice to be had by someone else. Or even if they know they are eligible, they don't know the price that they should pay, so people are kind of overcharged. That, that creates a margin for overcharging. So what the, the government wanted to do, uh, and that was their idea, is that we should have a card uh, where uh, people, uh, so that's kind of the card that they came up with, it, uh, we should have a card so people know that they are eligible for this program. Uh, so that's, and they came up to, they came to the researchers to get advice, not on should we do RASC in the first place, or even should we do this card, but can you help us evaluate the effect of the card? And there what the, the, the researchers could, uh, could do is to propose to say, well, fine, we are going to evaluate the card, but uh, as we are at it, um, uh, might we try different variants to know which card was going to work uh, uh, the best? So they try different models of the cards. So uh, some of the cards have different information than others. The cards are quite small there, uh, but the, the bottom line is one of them has the price that uh, the rice is being sold for, and one of them doesn't. Uh, then uh, in some cases, they distributed the card to some people, uh, but not everyone. So the village would know the kind of people who are eligible, but some people, their name was on the list, but they didn't get the physical card. In some villages, on the other hand, they went all out. Everyone got a card, and they had huge posters and, uh, and uh, a campaign, uh, public uh, information campaign. And the idea there was to create common knowledge so that the local official knows that the people know that they have, uh, the, sorry, the, that they are eligible. And also maybe people know that the local official knows that they know, and so on and so forth. So that changed the, the bargaining. Uh, when everybody knows what are uh, what are the position, uh, and finally there was this idea that so the, e to understand the, how a card like that would work, it could work because it empowered the uh, uh, the villagers, or it could work because it makes the the people who run the program on the ground realize that someone is watching over them. So in order to separate the two, they 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 had a version of the card that has a lot of clip-on coupon that needed to be sent back up that increased the kind of wood was meant to increase the impression of accountability. So these kind of ideas were all kind of emerged uh, by discussing with the partners and seeing, well, what is it that I where there is genuine uncertainty of the best way to structure this program. Therefore, if we know that the program, you know, the program does increase uh, take up and uh, transfer to the, to the population, uh, you can uh, put your best foot forward to uh, e expand it. Uh, and what they found on, on average is that any version of the card on average works in the sense that poor families get got a 26% increase in subsidy. And importantly, it doesn't come from in poor other poor people who were getting it before uh, uh, and may, may not have been eligible, but were near poor, let's say. It comes from a reduction. So reduction in leakage, so it really comes more from the pocket of the, the, the implementers of the program. So obviously it's quite cost-effective because it's, it's very cheap to distribute cards. 
Uh, they also found which was the version of the car that was working the best. And that's this idea of putting first put the price to so have the full information and then go all out, give it to everyone and add the poster. So then the government very quickly moved on. And this is the example where one evaluation leads to massive scale up because it was literally, it was kind of tinkering within the thing that was happening anyway. So it's definitely context relevant. It was done to improve implementation and it was uh, scaled up to improve implementation. So we learned something. So the, the, that, that, that was already at scale anyway. So the, 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 the adoption could be very fast. In terms of another country thinking about this problem, they might not structure the card in the same way, but at least they know what they, you know, what the questions they need to ask themselves uh, to move forward. Uh, so, if, so there, there was immediate scale up to and then to 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 a lot of people. And another example of one of those uh, of those uh, places where the sort of more direct policy influence happens through a uh, kind of working in close uh, a partnership is the an a project I was involved with with uh, Michael Greenstone, uh, Roy Nipande and Nick Ryan on uh, uh, pollution in, in Gujarat. So Gujarat is a fast growing industrial state in India. It's also the most polluted places on earth uh, in general and some of the uh, I think some of these industrial places literally belong to the to the kind of world record of most polluted places. Uh, part of the reason is that uh, the farms are, are not uh, really respecting the regulations. There is a pretty strict regulation, but it's not being respected. A few years ago, citizens sued the government, uh, saying that, look, you have regulation on the book. Nobody is respecting it. You, do, you need to improve your, you need to improve your uh, uh, enforcement of regulation. And what the court, uh, the Supreme Court of Gujarat uh, decided is that since the government seems to be unable to uh, execute the, on, the, uh, on the regulation, they need to bring in uh, third party auditors. So that was a good, you know, good concept potentially, bringing it new capacity. Um, so a third party audit is uh, you, you basically each firm needs to hire an auditor that's kind of a, a private firm. Uh, they get three uh, uh, physical audits in the year. Here they collect water, or they collect uh, uh, air from the chimney. And then the firms need to uh, produce a report that is given to the, to the, the auditing firm produce a report that's given to the company, uh, to the polluting company, and given to the government as well. And it's actionable. In principle, the government can follow through and find the firms. Um, so this uh, program actually uh, was uh, it didn't work, uh, or there was a va widespread impression that it didn't work. And in fact, uh, paradoxically, the, 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 the polluting firms, the industrial firms, sued the government to say, you're not using the results of this report. So basically, it amounts to a tax, because you are not using the results, uh, and then therefore, it's not a regulation which was a bit paradoxical because the reason why they were not using is that there was this widespread perception that these reports were uh, 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 bogus. Now, why would this re uh, uh, report being, being bogus? Well, you have a system where the, 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 comp the, the firm is hiring the auditing, the company, the polluting uh, company is hiring the auditing firm and paying them. Uh, so obviously, uh, if you want to keep your business as an auditing firm, you might provide the company with you know, the results they might like to hear. So the structure of the program where the, the, it came from a good principle, which is polluter pays, therefore the, the firm should be paying the company, but it created this obvious room for uh, conflict of interest. And before you nod your head thinking, what were they thinking when they were developing this program? This is exactly how financial audits work in the, in the US and that led uh, to the Enron crisis way back when, then to the subprime crisis in 2008. We keep talking about reforming the system in the US. So you, an SEC, um, SEC chairman uh, had a proposition and it has not been done. Contrary to here where they were like, oh yeah, there is an issue with our, with our problem. And after they won the, the, the fight against the industry, the polluting company, so they won the fight in court, 
thank goodness, because it would be really paradoxical to win a suit saying we've corrupted your system so much that it's useless, so please remove it now. Uh, the, uh, the government actually, uh, uh, the lawyer of the government actually conducted, contacted uh, Roini Pandey and they were in, in search of structuring this better. Um, so that's, you know, just again in saying we keep giving lessons to, to either government of people in developing countries. Here it's, they actually were interested in reforming the system for real. Uh, but let's first see how, uh, whether the system, the first thing we said is like, let's look how good or bad your system is. And so this is what we, uh, this is what you have. Uh, this is the, the results of the pollution audit in the, in funds that are under the status quo system. Uh, and th the red line is the threshold that's allowed pollution. This is for one particular uh, pollutant, SPM. It's one of the very important ones. That's what gets into your lung uh, um, when the air is very polluted. And you can see that 73% of the firm pollute just under the allowed threshold, which suggests really great efficiency from the firm or from the people who are writing the audit. So what we did uh, a few weeks uh, is that uh, uh, w within a week or two of this report, we took a random sample of the f of the uh, of the firms, and we sent back a team of students from an engineering college, and they went and they performed the same measurement, and that's what they found. Uh, so these are the same firms, and this is what the measurement they find. And you see two things. First of all, uh, or three things. First of all, there are only now 19 percent of firms that are just above uh, uh, below the threshold. Second of all, a lot of the firms, a lot of the mass of the distribution is to the right, so they pollute more. And interestingly, some is to the left, so in fact they produce much less than what's reported in the, in the report. So you might ask yourself, why would an audit tell you that you're polluting more than you pollute? And the answer is that, well, if you're going to make up your data anyways, you know, why bother going? So what, what happens is that they stopped going, and in fact they were selling their audit report for less than the actual bare minimum cost of running an audit. Because if you're gonna make up the data, you can as well do it for cheap, and therefore you get, you're even less likely to be, to be recruited, more likely to be recruited. So what we proposed, and in fact this was based on this report from the SEC chairman uh, after the Enron crisis for the, for the, uh, for the reform of the uh, audit system in the US, was random assignment of auditors uh, and fixed payment from a central pool, so that severes the link between the firm and uh, the auditing firm and the polluting firm. Uh, back check auditors for accuracy. And finally, now that we've severed the private link, crank, a social in, is an incentive for the social good uh, by having a payment or continuation in the, in the scheme uh, based on accuracy. So this is what we found. We, so we ran an experiment of that. And this is what we found for the, tr for the treatment firms. The audit report are now looking much more similar uh, to the truth. Uh, and now the audit, of course, becomes, uh, becomes uh, relevant. Let me skip that. I want to finish the last 13 minutes uh, by talking about development finance in the 21st century. So this is where I depart from the, from the JPAL work. And in a sense, depart from my own uh, uh, professed and real uh, complete lack of interest or almost complete lack of interest in uh, aid or cooperation for all these years because I've always made the point that look what it doesn't matter if aid works or it doesn't work aid is so small what matters is the eff effectiveness with which the amount of money that's being spent by the developing country themselves is being used uh, that money, that stock of money needs to be used well. And aid, you know, ideally would be used to make sure that it is the case. But if aid is used very poorly, then, you know, so be it. It's not going to change the world. Uh, and for the same reason, I wasn't, you know, I, all good if more aid is being given because uh, there are moments where it really makes a difference, in particular in acute crisis. There are moments where uh, uh, the lack of aid really makes a difference. Again, we saw it in the COVID crisis that we were in present. But, uh, you know, eventually that's not where the big changes are going to come from. So no point fighting about that. But I've changed, I've recently changed my view, at least on the latter, thinking that uh, 
the amount of international money, and I, it's definitely not aid for reasons that are going to become obvious in a moment, that we need to generate is, is actually it matters uh, both for its uh, quantity, but also uh, both because we could do, uh, the, those countries could, could make good use of the money, in fact, and also because uh, um, of uh, uh, justice. Uh, so that's why I want to just finish with development finance. And it's all about climate. Uh, and it's not, here I'm not going to be talking about anything we can do to, to, uh, to address climate change. Uh, I'm talking about the fact, about the, the, the behavior that we are, uh, th what's happening today and how we, uh, what uh, responsibility that puts uh, on us, uh, citizens of the, of the richer country. So there was there is a lot of discussion around the term of reparations that uh, you know the, all of the carbon that is in the atmosphere is a stock, and that stock is there mainly because of the the path that we took during the industrial revolution, and therefore we 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 have a debt to the poor countries. I agree with that, but uh, we have a debt in many other ways: colonization, slavery, etc. And I've never seen it to be a political argument that had any traction because, well, you know, we, not, uh, you know, this is most people, uh, rightly or wrongly, wrongly, but uh, politically that's just a fact, are not interested in atoning for the past, of, for the fault of their ancestors. But the point is that that's not just the past, it's also the present. Uh, the most of the emissions that are responsible for climate change are mainly due to the behavior of rich country citizens. And usually that point gets obscured because you say, well, you know, historically it's true that the emissions have been in, uh, are coming from Europe and, and the US, but now look at India, look at China. And what this is forgetting is that uh, India and, and China are producing emissions in the service of goods that are consumed uh, in the US or in Europe. So Lucas Chancel will be talking tomorrow, and he's the one who is one of the teams that have made this this point, and this comes from from uh, his work. If we look at, we should really l uh, try to estimate for every person their full carbon footprint, which is not just the energy that is that they consume on their floor, on their you know as they drive their car but also the energy that uh, has been, uh, the, the CO2 that has been put in the atmosphere to produce that car. And of course, not just CO2, but all of the other stuff, like environmental uh, uh, degradation that comes with it. With the debate on electric car, that kind of makes it, should make it very clear, and sometimes people miss that, that uh, that's, the, that's the source of the tension. More generally, uh, so what we can do is we can, so the point is we of course don't know, we will we'll have a carbon footprint for uh, people, for each individual, uh, but there are various ways to kind of estimate one. And one of the one is, and that's the Lucas uh, Chancel technology is to say, well, let's estimate the, from survey data, the elasticity of carbon emission with respect to income. That turned out to be about 0.5. And then therefore we can now combine with data on income distribution, they have it over here upstairs in the, in the building, and that gives us a, a, a distribution of estimated carbon footprint by, by, by individual, which can then be either aggregated or not. So if we, uh, if we start by the individual uh, point, uh, you get this very simple uh, uh, rule, which I like, which is the 1050. It nicely works in two directions. 10% of the world population is responsible for about 50% of the emission. Uh, that's the highest, uh, the highest 10% of the highest emitters, the 10% highest emitters are responsible for 50% of the uh, pollution in the, uh, of the emission in the world. And con uh, it's actually not quite, it's uh, 48%. And the bottom 50% of the emitters are responsible for about 10% uh, of the emission. Again, that's not quite, that's 11.5. Uh, there is no reason why it would work <laughs> like that way. It just happens to be so that you can just remember 1050. Uh, so the, the emissions are highly, highly uh, unequally distributed. This is work from another team from Bruckner at the World Bank, different methodology, almost the same results. Uh, and and the, the map looks uh, nice. Uh, it shows that, of course, the high polluters mainly live in, in rich countries. 
uh, in particular the US, which is a little bit of an outlier. Uh, uh, and they certainly don't live in Africa where uh, consumption, where emissions are so small. Uh, this is back to the Lucassian cell number. I'm happy to go from one to the other because the numbers are very similar. You see the ton of CO2 uh, equivalent per person and per year to be 21 uh, ton in, in the US uh, and 1.6 in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, even if we uh, manage to, sometimes they, we feel that, I'm um, asked often this question, which really rattles me, is that, oh, you know, should we understand these countries are, small, uh, are, are, uh, are poor, but should they be degrowth because we need to control? Uh, and that's the best way to look at it. This is uh, um, the increase in emission that would be, uh, that would happen if we achieve uh, uh, the SDG or the poverty related goals in the SDG so people would become richer. They would become richer, they would consume more, but they are so poor in the first place and they consume so little in the first place that that would uh, hardly register. So if we manage to completely uh, 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 um, uh, achieve uh, eradication of extreme poverty, that would increase emissions, sorry, not decrease, increase emission by 2% only. So basically the whole point about Africa needs to do something about mitigating climate change, that's nuts, because there is nothing they can do. It's, it's just they contribute for nothing. So it's not even a matter of you know, the choice that they have. They, have, they, they are not responsible for anything that's happening. Um, and in India, it's at the country level, it's true, but again, remember, the, it's less true, but remember the emissions are a lot of production that of stuff we consume and also the inequality within the world. So someone in Bihar contributes nothing to climate change. Maybe someone in Delhi who happened to have a 25 stories house with uh, 55 cars does. Uh, the cost of climate change, so that's the first point. The, the, the cost of climate change, on the other hand, are going to be felt uh, in the poorer part of the world. Um, the, the Global Impact Lab at the University of Chicago and the UN have put together beautiful maps that put that together. The first thing that's today, there's nothing here that's special. Um, the, um, you were trying to let me see, oh no, yeah, I'm 422 is my, <laughs> I'm even below that. The, 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 the poor countries tend to be in warm places. Therefore, as the, as the, uh, the, the earth become warmer, they are going to be, m they are going to have experienced more of this extremely hot day. And it turned out that going from 20 degrees centigrade to 22 doesn't have the same effect on your body than going from 32 to 35. So between 32 and 35 is where it becomes uh, injurious to human health, uh, the temperature. And you can see that these poorer countries are going to experience uh, more of those hot days by 2050 in particular. Of course, uh, Africa, uh, uh, the, the uh, South Asia, uh, and the, 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 the north of Latin America, the, the poor, poor parts of Brazil. That's the first problem. The second problem is that income is extraordinarily protective against the impact of this temperature. So think of a very hot day in Texas, and people crank up the in air conditioning, and think of a very hot day in a rural area in Pakistan, and there is no air conditioning to turn on and you need to work outside and so on. Uh, so again, it's work from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Tamar Kelton at Chicago at, uh, and the, the work of the Global Impact Lab and EPIC uh, with Michael Greenstone, uh, uh, kind of using historical data to look at the impact of hot days on human health by li little, little region. And then this is an extrapolation across the world I haven't shown you the map. This is actually the, this is estimated on a much smaller number of regions, but it's, there is a nap, nice uh, map extrapolated. You, what you see here is a change in mortality rate for an extra day at 35 degrees relative to the reference, uh, reference temperature. And of course, if it gets super hot in Alaska, people will die because they are not very used to hot days. So they are not prepared for it. But there, are, there won't be very many of those days. But then if it gets super hot in Africa, people will die because uh, they, don't, they are not equipped because they don't have the money to be equipped. And, and, that's, uh, and there will be many very hot days in Africa. So when you combine the two, uh, you can calculate the mortality cost under a kind of business as usual scenario. And you're seeing that you know, the deaths are really concentrated in, the, in, in particularly the, the, uh, Africa. Uh, this is the mortality cost by 2000. 
uh, where you think that actually most of the OECD will not experience any cost in mortality due to temperature. It doesn't mean there is not going to be massive transformation of our world in ways we don't like it with climate change. Sure. But the people are going to die in Africa. They are going to die in Pakistan. They are going to die in Bangladesh. They are going to die uh, in, in India. So the, 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 the estimates, again, from, from the work, the work that's published in the QGA recently, uh, from a very large number of uh, authors putting this uh, together, uh, their estimate is that uh, it will lead to an increase that if we go business as usual, there will be an increase in 73 deaths per 100,000 people just due to due temperature alone. So this is not the other cost of climate, climate change. That might seem not so very much until you realize that that's the number of deaths from all of the infectious disease combined today. So imagine wiping out all of the gains we had, and this is more than that even, for malaria. Imagine fully, cure, fully curing malaria, uh, tu uh, HIV, tuberculosis. If we continue at this scale, we still would, be, uh, would have fewer, uh, more deaths than today. And that's entirely due to countries that are outside the OECD. So if you put one on one together, I really believe that through our behavior today, we just are imposing this cost every single year on the poor countries. And what, the, what are these costs? These costs are simply the, the, um, the, the tons of carbon, consumption carbon that I, I showed today, multiplied by the price of this carbon I'm putting, I'm taking the lowest possible number here. This is $37 per ton. I'm done. Uh, but I'm actually, in fact, almost done. I'm putting the lowest number here, which is the $37. That's just the, the equivalent of the, the going from the value of a statistical life. So it's just the cost as of a ton of carbon due to the death that we're seeing. So of course, it's not a full cost of carbon at all, but this is, this we can clearly see that this cost is imposed in developing countries only. If you take that number, multiply the emission in Europe and the US by 37, we arrive at a nice round number of $500 billion a year. So this is the damage we, uh, we impose on the poor people in the world every year. Uh, just to put this in perspective, uh, U.S. foreign assistance is 56 uh, 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 um, billion. Uh, France, after a much improvement, is 17. Uh, so we are not even like there. It's not about cooperation, and it's not going to happen by spending better the money that's available. So the, I have uh, br very briefly, I have three questions that I'm thinking about. Uh, the first one is how to raise it. Uh, the second is how to spend it. Uh, uh, so so the, the first one, sorry, was how much. So that's our idea. Then how to raise it. There are a number of solutions that people are uh, toy, uh, kind of uh, ping-ponging about. Uh, they, I think they had high hope for a uh, for, uh, tax on international shipping. The French had, but uh, these are the U.S., not China. It has any interest, so it, it might or might not happen. Uh, my one proposal that I'm, uh, I'm kind of working on is since we've already, we already have an agreement on a 15% minimum t uh, tax that was brokered uh, by the OECD uh, with actually French leadership over many years. Uh, why not add a few percent to that and devote it to this fund? It would be a, a, a mechanism. This, this is progressive because this goes to the, to the biggest uh, multinational corporation only. Uh, and we already kind of um, have uh, the element of a mechanism it would be added to that. Uh, Gabriel Zuckman, as uh, uh, observatory, uh, which is also here at PSC, has a, a simulation of how much money we could raise by increasing this. So I just took these numbers. Uh, so at 15%, without carve out, you get to 200 billion euros. This is the money is only being spent. We can't uh, we can't use that one. But if you added 3%, you could raise 300 billion. If you added 5%, you could, uh, you could, add, you could raise four, 400 billion. 5% would be a tax of 20%. The, the, US, the French corporate tax is already above that. So that would not even affect uh, France at all. So France should really love this proposal. Uh, and uh, 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 basically, that would raise the, and it's still a pretty reasonable uh, corporate tax rate, uh, if you ask me. So that's kind of one, one solution. That's not probably the only one. Uh, the question is like how to spend it. 
So uh, Thomas Piketty has a, a number of, uh, in a number of different places, has, has evoked that problem and saying how how to spend the money. And his view is that it belongs to the developing country, should be just given to the government. We have no no rights to do anything with it. I think we also have to think about the fact that even within country, there is a lot of inequality in carbon consumption and also in the cost of the damages. So my personal preference is that one should uh, do something to ensure it goes to the poorest. Uh, and one way to think about this is to have uh, three pillars, one which was actually talked about by the Minister um, uh, for uh, digital transformation in Togo was to have automatic uh, cash transfers uh, in either anticipating or in reaction to extreme weather events that could spend a lot of money <laughs> and so in good in good years we could kind of build the infrastructure and we've seen during COVID that it can be built relatively easily make sure that everybody is within reach of uh, of a system and then in and then have a system uh, have a kind of mechanisms to for automatic transfer so we don't lose time thinking about where to get the money from. In Togo, they put the system in place in a couple of weeks and then they, they spent six months to get money from AFD and finally they got like five, five million from AFD, which was like so small. Uh, so they, it took them a lot of time to, uh, uh, to raise what they needed or anything close to what they needed. The second, of course, is when need to uh, uh, improve energy access to protect people, but do it in a way that's, uh, that's uh, not damaging the environment at the same time. And the third, and that's going back to preaching for my own, uh, preaching for my own parish, is that there is so much we don't know. In many ways, the, the conversation on, uh, on uh, climate is, is, is kind of uh, the dark ages where we were in talking about poverty uh, 20 years ago, that people are going with their magical thinking that we should do this, we should do that. Nobody evaluates anything. Um, most of the things when they are evaluating don't work, similar to where we were before. There is a huge need for acceleration of, 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 re of research there. Uh, I don't think in developing countries the priority is mitigation, honestly, uh, but, uh, but there is a lot of work to do for adaptation because people need to find new ways to work. And I think more generally, I think they should be more open to you know, education, because we need educated people to, uh, to help uh, all of the life, like, so that, that kind of improving, uh, finding various ways to improving the way they live. Uh, so I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much uh, for your. Uh, um. We, we have a bit of time left for questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm a little tired. <laughs> There's a, a question at the very back. I ah, you have a phone, a, a microphone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, just coming back to this big title that was given to you, one thing you didn't mention that might be quite important in the 21st century is AI. So do you quickly want to comment on what we should do about that with respect to development? <laughs> uh, we should try to understand it better. It's a bit beyond my pay grade. Um, it's moving really fast. And uh, I'll tell you my one worry. Uh, I'm somewhat skeptical that AI is going to dramatically change the way that we do development. Uh, I am very concerned that it's going to take away uh, the job of uh, uh, all of uh, kind of newly rising middle class in, in many countries that have worked on, on software, on back office processing operation and so on. So I think the first order impact of AI in developing countries is going to be uh, 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 huge disruption of uh, labor markets similar to what we've experienced with non-AI over the last uh, few years in, uh, in, the, in richer countries where people have been displaced by just you know, spreadsheets and also export to India. So that's, my, that's, that's kind of what I see with AI, but I realize it's a little uh, um, narrow-minded perhaps. 
and you know there is a lot to think about <laughs> beyond that other questions Olivier oh. first of all. Um, just a question linked maybe to the private sector. Um, the private sector is full of uh, right, people educated and um, on top of the regulation policies, governments and everything that it's a top-down measure. What do you think the private sector could do uh, in a common sense way without waiting for policies to come and to be imposed and to be driven towards, uh, I would say, a more, um, um, I would say, a fair climate change uh, approach and a less growth and growth approach in the, in the strategies. So it, it depends uh, on in what sector. Uh, I, I think the private sector is very well placed to do what private sector do, uh, to do uh, what's, you know, driven by standard profit mo motive, like creating, uh, inventing new products, uh, uh, creating jobs, uh, putting people into these jobs, and so on and so forth. And for that, uh, you know, all power to the private sector and whatever can be done to, to ensure the development of, of, of private sector in, in these countries is really helpful. So I kind of like the private sector for its bread and butter activities. Where I'm getting a little skeptical is, uh, the role that that or the hope that we have given to the private sector in uh, solving this public goods problem i honestly don't think the private sector is very well set up to to solve public goods problems simply because that's not the that's not it the way it's created private sectors at the end of the day respond to shareholder uh, you have you know unique forms or small numbers of forms and unique people who have different views uh, as shareholder, but most shareholders ultimately uh, want to make money. And ultimately, that's kind of what the private sector does. And for example, over the last uh, many years of COPs, the role of private sectors has been kind of both uh, invoked as like uh, going to solve our problem and uh, in practice expanded. And what this means, uh, what it goes in two uh, parts. One is the uh, huge expansion of uh, ESG, environmental uh, social governments. And well, while it's definitely started from a, a good place, I think what we're seeing with the development of ESG as a business is that, well, as a business, the goal and your responsibility is to make as much money as possible. And therefore, you're going to do the ESG in this way uh, as well. And uh, we are seeing two things happening. And here it's not me with you know my kind of crazy left left wing views, but you have it one report after the other in the Wall Street Journal or the Economist of like outright fraud in the ESG uh, in the uh, in the use of ESG funds or in the allocation of ESG funds, and then the other is more uh, the sort of greenwashing and then impact washing, which is you know you do want to you 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 think that ESG is important for branding whatever relation but you know you might as well since the, the the ultimate goal is to make profit for your shareholder do it in the cheapest way possible and i don't think there is any ev evil in that it's just the structure of the world so unless we have uh uh so hence my view on the private sector honestly is that first order it should pay taxes uh, that can be used to do to provide public goods by the institutions that are well placed to provide public goods, which are the institutions that are elected by their citizens to provide public goods. It's perhaps kind of uh, very old fashioned, but that's how I, I, I see it. And uh, and then you know the private sector should provide private goods <laughs> in a way that is um, in a way that is being uh, regulated so that it doesn't provide pub, uh, private bads in the process. Hence the need for regulation, for uh, living condition, minimum wage, uh, uh, how, you know, how you deal with, how you treat your employees, uh, and of course, all the, climate, uh, all the climate regulations. And I don't think we can, and, and I think first order, a lot of the way that the private sector can do better is by 
uh, uh, creating less bad in the pursuit of its um, main job, which is mostly uh, good and worthwhile doing, but less negative externalities in the process of that. But for that, we, we, we do know that there is no, if uh, nobody provides, or very few people provide public good out of the goodness of their heart. You know, we, we, we do need governments to, uh, uh, to set the, 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 the rules of the game and even more than governments today, and this is what makes it very difficult, international cooperations, because uh, problems like emissions, are of course, pandemic, are at a, at a global level. Okay, I think, yeah, we have time for at least one more question, uh, perhaps at the back. To take, if you want to take them together so people have time to speak, I can then respond to, to all of them at once. Yes, in, in, your, in your very wide uh, range uh, talk, you didn't mention uh, often institution and power sharing and uh, democracy, uh, uh, neither at the level of the states, neither at the global level, the possibility of uh, a global democracy. So do you, do you think you can bypass these problems or what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm sure you can bypass this problem. That's, that's exactly it. <laughs> of course, I don't think you can bypass this problem. <laughs> I was given like one hour. So I, I could not, uh, I could not see. I put, uh, for the conclusion, I put development uh, in the 21st century with a question mark. Uh, that was meant to, if I had time, to start looking at that. And not because I don't think it's important. I think political economy problems are hugely important. Uh, but uh, even one, and then, you know, they are critical in getting some of the things I was talking about uh, adopted, obviously. They are critical to the answers I gave uh, to the private sector questions. But, you know, there is uh, um, two things. Once I had only an hour. And second, the, the, the gist of my work has really been to, to show that there is so much scope within the context of the institutions we do have that while uh, uh, some people can dream of new institutions and they should and come up with ways to get there, you know, other people who have more, uh, more uh, narrow mind can uh, improve things within the, uh, the space that exists. Okay, so I think we can take one, one more question at the back. It was mentioned in the presentation that the eradication of extreme poverty would be correlated with a 2% increase in emissions was also mentioned that climate change would hit developing countries hardest. So it seems that developing countries need to choose between extreme poverty and climatic destruction. What no, is the balance to be no, it, There's struck? no balance. What I was trying to say with this 2% is developing countries, or at least the poorest, are contributing nothing to the emission. There is no trade-off. Uh, the developing countries need to need to be able to, to give resources to their citizens through growth, through broad distribution, anything. But there is no trade-off because where it's going to happen if we reduce emission is in our behavior. I don't see any trade-off. And I think it's very important to, uh, if you have to take one thing away from today, just take that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think I think uh, we're, we're reaching the, the 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 start of the of the coffee break. So 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 let me uh, uh, collectively uh, uh, thank Essie for a very stimulating talk, and. Um, <laughs>